Welcome to our second lecture covering the topic of employee privacy and the management of personnel, personal information. So let's get started. During our first presentation, we covered um, the first two topics. We covered the topic of kind of an overview of the topic of privacy, and then we talked about the concept reasonable expectation of privacy. Well, we, you will see that uh, term is going to be popular with us again in this next presentation. And in fact, this will be this term will be following us throughout all the presentations. Um, we will be covering the constitutional issues and the statutory issues that are in play in the privacy area. When we think about the constitutional issues, we're really going to be talking about when you are employed by the government. When we're talking about statutes, there will be a combination of government and private um, employer situations. So I'm going to say call the second category both. And that will also be the case with our third category, which we won't be covering in this lecture, which is the common law issues. So let's advance to the um, constitutional topics. Here we go. So little review. When the government is the employer, we care about the constitutional issues because again, our federal constitution protects you and me residents of the United States from actions of the federal, state, and local governments. It does not protect me from you or you from me, um, and it doesn't protect either one of us from private employers. So if we work for Walmart, Walmart can abuse us and mistreat us in all kinds of ways, and no constitutional issue is going to be raised. All kinds of statutes might be broken, all types of common law rules might be broken, but it's just impossible for Walmart to uh, affect our constitutional rights. It just doesn't have the power to do so because it's not about, the Constitution isn't about our relationship with each other, but our relationship with the federal government. But when we are employed by the federal government, that's when these rights continue, uh, the, the, these are rights that we find in the Constitution apply. You might think to yourself, well, gosh, when I work for the federal government, I'm not really thinking of the government as my government. I'm thinking of it as my employer. Um, perhaps so, but it, whether the, um, the government is your employer or not, whenever you're interacting with your government, then the Constitution applies. And as a result, being an employee of the federal, state, or local government means that you have certain protections that other people who are employed in the private sector aren't going to have. It's one of the reasons, frankly, to consider employment with the government. There's advantages and disadvantages to it, but this is one of those advantages. Many of the privacy rights that we're going to be talking about are found either directly or indirectly in the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. Let's just take a peek at that to see what we're talking about when we talk about the Fourth Amendment. So I'm going to go over here and pull up the Fourth Amendment right here. I have it here. This is the Fourth Amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. You may see in it that there is no mention of privacy, but it's kind of implied in this, isn't it? I mean, we have this right to be secure in our persons, houses, uh, papers, and effects. And so the idea is, well, if we have this right, surely it's because we have a right to privacy. That's got to be what's hidden behind here. Or at least that's what Constitution or the, the Supreme Court has interpreted this language to mean. And that's that idea of the penumbra that we talked about, that we talked about in the Griswold versus Connecticut case. The idea was uh, the Founding Fathers must have thought there was a a right to privacy um, because otherwise why would they have found this right in the Fourth Amendment? Let's just look at the Fifth Amendment for a second. Um, and this is a similar idea that we'll see. Um, that a person can't be compelled in any criminal matter to be a witness against himself nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall property, private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So again, there's this idea of um, a liberty interest, a privacy interest kind of being in play under these circumstances. 
And then now let's go to the 14th Amendment, and we'll see our other big amendment in this area. Um, and this has to do with the due process. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And so again, this idea that we're entitled to process. And so um, that is where part of that idea of privacy comes from. But the Fourth Amendment is probably the main part. Now, you may have noticed in the Fourth Amendment that it talked about unreasonable searches and seizures. Yes, if you are subject to governmental action that is unreasonable in the area of search and seizure, the Constitution has been violated. But it's also entirely possible that the government follows its procedures and has reasonable reason to do the search. The search may not turn up anything. That doesn't mean that the search warrant wasn't valid. Sometimes search warrants are perfectly valid, but they end up not being uh, leading to any kind of uh, criminal charges or any evidence of a crime. So uh, we see this word unreasonable. We talked about reasonable expectation of privacy. We talked about how that's an uh, objective standard. As you can imagine, the term unreasonable is also an objective standard. Unreasonable means not reasonable. So something contrary to that objective reasonable standard we talked about. So when we're evaluating whether a search is reasonable or not, we don't ask the person who's being searched. Almost certainly that person is going to say, this search was unreasonable. We also don't ask the police officer that is uh, conducting the search because in almost every case he or she is going to find that, oh yeah, the search was completely reasonable. No, both of them are perhaps being completely sincere when they answer the question, but they are not objective. They're an interested party in this transaction. When we're looking at reasonableness, we recognize as an objective standard, it's kind of an average of what the average person would think is reasonable. And so of course, if the average person would find that something is not reasonable, then we would say it is unreasonable. So there are limits to the right of privacy. It's not absolute, even when we're dealing with the government. Um, and, um, any impingement upon privacy has to be reasonable. Again, that objective term. Okay, so here's um, an example. A search of an employer's office by a supervisor. Again, we're talking about the federal government. So this is uh, the employee here is working for the federal government. Will be justified at its inception as beginning when there was reasonable grounds. Again, that term, that objective standard for suspecting the search will turn up evidence that the employee is guilty of work-related misconduct. Now, it doesn't, they don't have to have the smoking gun already. They're looking for the smoking gun. I mean, it could become a catch-22 if you had to have really strong evidence before you get the search warrant. Well, you can't get the strong evidence because you don't have the search warrant. And so it becomes this vicious uh, circle. So you don't have to have the smoking gun evidence. You just have to have credible evidence that there can possibly be some misconduct going on here. Let's consider an example. Mary worked as a public assistance coordinator for the county. It's a little note here. We talked about government employees, but this isn't restricted just to the federal government or state government. It can be local, city government, county government, um, any level of government really. So Mary's working for the county. Her supervisor, Bob, receives information from a credible source. Again, this is a credible source, so we have a reasonable basis that Mary has engaged in food stamp fraud. Could this credible uh, source be mistaken? Absolutely. Could this credible source be lying? Sure. Um, at this point, we don't have anything remotely like beyond a reasonable doubt. We just have enough to, for us, to, for Bob at least, to think, I need to, to, to dig a little bit here. There's enough here that I need to figure out what's going on. Maybe nothing, maybe even probably nothing, but I have a sufficient basis now to be suspicious. But let's imagine a different scenario. Let's say that Mary has just had a nasty breakup with her boyfriend. 
and Bob has gotten to know the boyfriend because Mary and Bob have a some level social relationship and Bob knows that the boyfriend has had a habit of lying pretty regularly uh, this is something that Bob himself has observed the boyfriend has admitted of uh, telling a variety of lies um, to Bob uh, about various and sundry matters um, so now Mary and the boyfriend have broken up. The boyfriend calls up Bob and says, hey, Bob, I want to let you know that Mary's been uh, stealing uh, food stamps. Now, under those circumstances, the ex-boyfriend is not a credible source. He's really not a credible source for two reasons. First of all, he's a, a person who has an agenda against Mary because perhaps of the breakup. Number one. Number two, he's not a reliable person because of his pattern of dishonesty. Either one of those would probably be enough to make the the uh, uh, ex-boyfriend not a credible source, unless, of course, he has, um, you know, tape recordings of conversations or pictures of things uh, that uh, would point to this. But if it's just his testimony, he probably isn't credible. So we know it's not a situation like that. We have somebody that Bob has determined is credible, and so now he's going to follow up on that. So Mary is fired after Bob searches her office and finds evidence to support the allegation that she's been engaged in food stamp fraud. Under these facts, Mary has no recourse because Bob had a reasonable ground. Again, this is a reasonable st an objective standard. Mary doesn't think it's a reasonable ground, um, but uh, that's not the test. The test isn't what Mary thinks. The test is what a reasonable person looking at the totality of the circumstances, kind of the average citizen would think about this situation. Notice too, we don't look to Bob and say, well, Bob, did you think it was reasonable? Well, of course he thought it was reasonable. If he didn't think it was reasonable, he wouldn't have done it to begin with. So that's not the standard. It's what an outsider would have thought. So Mary has no recourse because Bob had a reasonable grounds to suspect that a search would reveal she was engaged in food stamp fraud. Let's say when Bob had gotten into the office, he found no evidence. There just was, it was clean as a whistle. There was no issue that Mary had anything wrong. Would that mean that he lacked a reasonable ground? No, we decide whether he has reasonable grounds uh, based upon what he knew at the time that he began the search. He doesn't have a crystal ball, obviously, and so it doesn't really matter whether he, uh, whether the search turns up good evidence or doesn't. The issue is what did Bob know at the time that he decided to conduct the search? So let's consider the um, O'Connor versus Ortega case. In this case, it's kind of similar to the Mary case. We have a state employee who, uh, because of some allegations against him, the, the uh, uh, employer, the government, uh, goes through his office desk. And the issue is, does he have an expectation of privacy under those circumstances? In this particular situation, the officials enter his office and seize both personal and state-owned items. And again, the, the, the uh, individual, I don't know if it's O'Connor or Ortega, we'll say it's O'Connor, was the doctor. Um, he's saying, hey, my First, First Amendment's rights were violated under these circumstances. Well, let's see what the U.S. Supreme Court decided. The U.S. Supreme Court says, listen, it's true, the doctor did have a reasonable expectation of privacy in his desk and his cabinets. Uh, the desk drawers were closed, the cabinets were closed, there might have even been a lock on it. Um, if he had a door on his office, that would be another indication that he had some reasonable expectation of privacy. But let's say his, his office was a, a cubicle with no door on it, and he had left things out on the surface of his desk. Probably not a reasonable expectation of privacy. Anyone walking by could look at it. The cleaning crew who comes in and dusts would have uh, been in and around that area. So under those circumstances, he probably wouldn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. But again, it's not an absolute privacy issue. We can see the next thing the court said was the reasonableness of the search is in light of the doctor's expectation of privacy. So we have to consider what the doctor understood his rights were. Let's say that in this particular uh, scenario, his boss had said, listen, we'll call it, we'll say that the doctor's name is Bob O'Connor. Listen, Bob, um, as long as you lock your door, no one's going in. We promise you, you have your own privacy. Just lock your door and, and everything's good. 
And let's say the supervisor has said this to Bob several times, and Bob has never heard of anybody entering an office um, to do any kind of search under those circumstances. And Bob's been there for five years, so he has a pretty significant track record. Well, under those circumstances, Bob would have a high expectation of privacy. And so that would make it more difficult for that um, uh, court or for, for that uh, supervisor to uh, find that that um, there was um, a, a reasonable basis for the search because Bob's had a very reasonable expectation of privacy under these circumstances. Okay, so let's consider a different scenario though. Let's say that while Bob has a key to his office, his supervisor when he gave the key said, listen Bob, I also have a key and from time to time I will need to go in. You should not put anything in your office that you don't want me to see because I will periodically be doing a check just to make sure there are no fire hazards, there's no uh, misuse of, of resources or anything along those lines you should realize that anything in your desk is fair game for me or somebody else in the organization to look at. And in fact, Bob has seen times where the supervisor has come in in the past into his office and he's heard other people say, yeah, my, my things were, were rearranged. When I asked my supervisor about it, she said that um, she, uh, she periodically does go through everybody's desk drawers. Under those circumstances, Bob O'Connor, the doctor, had no reasonable expectation of privacy. So again, it's all how the governmental employee employer controls that expectation. He, uh, the employer establishes what's reasonable based upon what he tells the employee and what the employer actually does. So uh, don't feel if you work for the government that somehow or another you're powerless. Um, the, the government employer gets to set the terms of that relationship and gets to establish what the range of those reasonable expectations of privacy is in this particular working environment. If there is a strong reasonable expectation of privacy, it's possible that a search warrant may be needed. Maybe before the supervisor went into Mr. Ortega, or sorry, excuse me, Mr. Dr. O'Connor's um, office, they needed to have a search warrant, possibly. And again, it's that balancing idea. What's the level of evidence that something is maybe awry? Um, how strong is the evidence? How, how serious is the allegations? Compared to how strong is the reasonable expectation of privacy? So one of the things that we need to contend with is, is what's being searched, is it the employers or the employees? Let's go back to a second for, to the Trotty case that we talked about during our first broadcast. We talked about how the locker was the employers, but the lock that was on the locker was the employees, and the stuff inside the locker was the employees. And so when the employer went into the locker, he was entering into its own space. It was a Walmart locker. But by removing the, the combination lock, that was removing something belonging to the employee. And by going through the purse, he was going through something that clearly belonged to the employee. Um, and so uh, when we're dealing with employer-owned property, um, it's fairly easy for an employer to establish that there is no reasonable expectation of privacy if the employer wants to do so. So ways of doing that with lockers would be make sure that the, the lock that is being used is one that the employer has issued, that the employer keeps a copy of the key if there's key based, keeps a copy of the combination if it's combination based, that the employee knows that, and that the employer periodically says, okay, today we're opening all lockers. Uh, it may be a scheduled thing, but it's probably a good idea to also to have some unscheduled times where the employee knows and to let the employee know, hey, there'll be some day in the future, I'm not telling you when, but someday in the future we'll open all the lockers and see what's inside. If the employer says that and follows through with it, then that employee is not going to have a reasonable expectation of privacy with respect to employer-owned property. Um, similarly, this similar thing can happen with computers, what you store on your hard drive. If the computer belongs to the employer, uh, and again, we're talking about the government employer situation, but actually these ideas could apply to private sector employers as well. Um, but, but all that stuff on the computer, if the computer belongs to the employer, could be fair game 
um, as long as the employer has not permitted that employee to develop a reasonable expectation of privacy about that material. We talked about that due process clause of the Fifth Amendment. We talked about that, about that the government shall not act in a way that a person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without uh, fair and proper prior notice. In other words, their privacy hasn't been invaded unless they knew that it might happen. Also, we talked about the due process and equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment. They again have some privacy concerns there. So we can see that penumbra around these, these 4th, 5th, and 14th Amendments do, even though they don't use the word privacy, they're kind of in that area. And that's one of the reasons why, as a governmental employee, you're likely to have more privacy rights than if you're a private sector employee. So let's talk about how the, the courts will interpret fundamental rights, things like privacy rights. Um, and, and the standard really is going to be strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, or rational basis. Those are the three scrutiny standards that we see for this. And which one is applied is going to turn on what the interest is that is being protected. Um, if it is considered a fundamental right, where the courts will apply a strict scrutiny standard, which means that there has to truly be a compelling state interest before the government has the right to um, intrude upon that interest. On the other extreme, the, 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 the least enforced protection would be the rational basis. In this case, all the government has to show is that its, its policy or its actions had a rational basis. It wasn't a crazy thing to do under the circumstances. Um, there are whole courses taught in law school about the 14th Amendment and the strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, and rational basis a test. So I'm just kind of introducing you to the terms. Just recognize this is a very, very deep topic. And it has issues especially um, with respect to race issues, but also gender issues. There, there's a broader uh, whole paradigm about much of this stuff. I've already kind of talked about these. So now we've, we've touched just briefly on the constitutional issues. As I said before, in this course, we're focused primarily on private sector employment. So we don't do too big, deep of a dive into the constitutional protections because obviously they only apply to federal government, or excuse me, to government employees, federal, state, or local. Now we're gonna talk about statutory issues. And again, this is a mixed bag. There are some statutory rights that apply just to federal employees, some that would just apply to state employees, and some that would apply to all employees. And so we'll kind of drill down and look at this more, more specifically. There's actually a lot of statutes here, but I'm just gonna focus on a few. One is FICRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. We'll talk more about this statute later. It's kind of a big deal in lots of different areas. Certainly it's a big deal in the consumer's business, but it's also a big deal in many employment situations. This, uh, you know, let, let's say you're being hired for a job and you need to get a background check. Well, guess what law is going to regulate how the employer goes about conducting and notifying you about the results of that check? FICRA, that's the source. Uh, credit checks, criminal background checks, all of that is in large measure uh, dictated by FICRA. FICRA doesn't really stop employers from doing those things but it regulates the employer. It tells the employer how it must go about doing it, what notices have to happen, and it's a pretty picky law. There's, pr there's a fair amount of hoops that have to be jumped through, um, deadlines that have to be met. It's kind of a bit of a logistical, uh, you know, tech uh, waltz that you have to pursue to, to get it right. So um, it, it's, it's not, inherently tricky, but it is technical. Um, and we'll talk more about this in a later class. We also have FERPA. Now this one doesn't have a lot of significance to employment. I mention this primarily because you as a student are affected by FERPA. Uh, all of your personnel, not so much personal, but your student records and personal information are protected from disclosure. And so in fact, uh, as a uh, 
employee at Collin College, I'm trained in FERPA to make sure I'm complying with all of those rules. And you probably heard from, or perhaps have heard from time to time, instructors saying, oh, I can't send that to you via email, or I can only send that to you to your Cougar Mail email, or something along those lines. Usually that's because of a FERPA concern. Yeah, not really that relevant to employment actions, but it is an important privacy law. Let's talk briefly about the Privacy Act of 1974. I'm just gonna pull it up here. Here we go. Um, this has to do with the federal government. Um, so this again does not have to do, this is the, the Privacy Act. This does not have to do with uh, private employers. And again, here's a statement about what it is. It regulates the release of personal information about federal employees by federal agencies. Again, I'm not expecting you to know the specifics. This is in fact all that I'm asking you to know about this. So the Privacy Act of 1974 has nothing to do with private employers. It doesn't even have to do with state employees or local employees. Um, so it's, it's relevance, I mean, there's no, it's not a small group of people it's relevant to, but it's really just focused on that category of folks. So if you end up being an HR or a uh, a person for a federal agency, this may well be a law that you need to be familiar with, but if that doesn't happen to be your journey, then this is not something that is of great significance to you. Let's talk about the ECPA, that's the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. This is a fairly big deal. It prohibits the interception, recording, or disclosure of wire, electronic, and audio communications, including email and voicemail. We'll talk about this more in a couple minutes. This has implications for both government and private employers. Then we have the Privacy for Consumers and Work Act of 1993. Um, employer monitoring of employees' workplace communications is lawful only when the employers give prior notice to employees. You know, we've talked about the importance of employers giving notice of uh, in maybe intrusions into the privacy of the employee insofar as it's it's it, but by the employer giving notice you're undermining the argument that the employee would have that he ha or she had a reasonable expectation of privacy and so that's one reason that employers are, are constantly communicating to employees look we're going to know about it don't do it and if you do do it we're going to find out and we're going to be looking for that uh, but another reason that uh, we see that employers want to make it clear to employees that yes, we are going to be monitoring what you're doing is this statute because it says, hey, we can only do this monitoring when we let the employee knows, know what's happening. So another reason that we want to let the employee know. Now you may think, well, why wouldn't you want the employee to know? What's the, what's the reason that some employers are reluctant? Well, one reason is that employees don't like to hear this. And so saying that to the employee is likely not to be a fun conversation. Uh, that may cause morale issues. It may cause some employees to quit. Who knows? That's one reason. Another reason is that when you let the employee know, then they may be more clever about how they engage in whatever misconduct they might, might be planning to engage in. Uh, you're less likely to catch people off guard if they know, hey, wait, the, the employer knows or the employees told me they're going to be checking my emails, so I'm not going to talk about that in my email. On the other hand, if the employee thinks his emails really are private, he might be more willing to say th some things that might incriminate him. And so for those two reasons, sometimes employers kind of are a little bit reluctant to share this information. But you know what? If the employee knows that the employer is monitoring, it might also cause the employee to choose not to engage in whatever the behavior is. So it can have some preventative power as well. Okay, so what is a wiretap? Well, a wiretap is inter intercepting, um, I think I have the actual definition, maybe I don't, is intercepting some electronic communication. Um, the government does this from time to time. Um, but the government can't use wiretaps for social or political purposes. They need to be for criminal investigations. So let's consider this scenario here. 
Bob was employed by the police department. His brother Larry is running for mayor. Bob conducted wiretaps to find out the political views of the people in the city in order to help Larry with his political campaign. When the police department learned about this, Bob was fired for unauthorized wiretapping. Under these facts, clearly Bob has violated the law because he was intercepting political information. That's prohibited. There was no indication that any crime was being committed. And so this statute, even though it's the federal statute, uh, usually is going to apply or something similar is going to apply in most states. Here's that ECPA that we were talking about earlier, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. And again, this applies to all forms of digital communication. It prohibits unauthorized eavesdropping and access to various types of messages. But look at this. There is a consent exception. So when the employee consents, then the employer can go ahead and get the information. You might say, well, that's easy to fix. I just won't consent. Well, guess what? If you don't consent, you've just unconsented yourself out of a job. Uh, the employer says, okay, in order for you to have this job, you need to consent. So think long and hard about it. You don't have to consent, but you're not staying here if you don't. So the consent isn't exactly always the most warm and fuzzy type of thing. Um, it's uh, a almost more consent in the sense that you know it's being done and you have to make an employment decision under those circumstances. Do I stay given the fact I know I'm going to be monitored or do I leave? And if I choose to stay, then I'm consenting to whatever that particular action is. Eavesdropping, what is that? Surreptitious, which is basically a long word for secret, overhearing of another person's private words, either by ear or through some artificial assistance, you know, having a bug in the phone or something like that. Uh, eavesdropping obviously can be criminal or it can be a civil matter. Um, there we go. Of course, eavesdropping can happen in the workplace. Listening in on a call in the workplace can be unlawful or it can be lawful. After 9-11, uh, the Congress passed a statute called the USA Patriot Act, and it was designed to give law enforcement additional tools to uh, find bad people, find potential or actual terrorists, and to investigate those um, uh, people or to find them and to hopefully stop their behavior, but if not to stop it, to find out who they are so that they can be apprehended. And so the goal here is to give law enforcement additional tools. Obviously, these tools are controversial because many people see civil liberty con liberty concerns in this. And so, again, the, the Congress was kind of balancing these types of concerns. So the USA Patriot Act allows the government to monitor anyone on the Internet simply by contending that the information is relevant to an ongoing a cr a criminal investigation. And the courts that issue this type of warrant are called FISA courts, and it's very, very secretive uh, so that the public don't, does not get to hear the evidence or even the fact that there is an issue about that particular person or that particular organization. Because obviously if that were revealed, then the, the investigation would be very compromised. Then there are a variety of other statutes. We can see here, this is the law we were talking about before the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. There are privacy issues with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, it's not unusual when we have a disability claim, as we talked about in another module, for the employer to get some information about the disability. Uh, private information that the employee very likely does not want people to have. Let's say, for example, that Bob is an employee, he's been diagnosed HIV positive, uh, and maybe he has AIDS and he needs some kind of accommodation. So it may have been necessary for the employer to obtain medical information from Bob's physician. Well, that information should not be stored in Bob's personnel file. Uh, probably lots of people are going to have access to the file. And so there ought to be a separate medical file, which has a much less broadly uh, broad access of folks into, in, to that. And so information such as medical claim forms, uh, health reports, 
uh, maybe physical, things like that, and things related to disability or workers' compensation claims, for example, need to go into this separate personnel file that's just about medical stuff. Uh, this is statutory. The uh, uh, evidence, especially with an American Disabilities Claim, where there's been commingling of these two files, is a violation of the statute. Now, I'll be honest with you, usually the government isn't focused on enforcing that part of the statute. But if that particular employer has commingled the paper, that is pretty good evidence, really COC sees as pretty good evidence that maybe that employer hasn't been very uh, responsible in handling the disability claim. So it's, first of all, a violation of the statute, and second of all, evidence that perhaps the employer is not behaving itself. We also see privacy issues with the National Labor Relations Act. We'll talk more about those when we get to the labor module. Uh, but to suffice it to say that the employer cannot um, always read the emails of employees, even if they're on a government on an employer's server, nor can the employer monitor private conversations, maybe especially during a union organizing campaign. But again, more about that later. And then OSHA again. OSHA we'll also talk about in a later pre uh, or another presentation. So at this point, we have completed uh, the constitutional issues that we have relating to governmental employment, and we've talked about some of the more important statutes that relate to privacy issues. In our next presentation, we'll discuss common law issues, and this is really where most of the activity is, so we'll be doing a pretty deep dive into this area. Anyway, I thank you for your attention. Of course, as always, if you have questions about the material, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email is cgroover at colin.edu. I'd love to hear from you. If, uh, but better yet, if you would like to, you're welcome to come to my office hours. My office hours are in the syllabus, and I'll be glad to sit down with you and talk to you at great length about these uh, topics. I thank you for your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.